Hi, welcome to True Story with John Gibson. Today we have a really exciting guest. Uh, he is a pride fighting veteran. He is a Pancras fighting championship veteran. Uh, the owner of North Cal Fighting Alliance, excuse me, uh, David Terrell. How you doing, man? Great, dude. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. Completely my pleasure. So I, I, I have a lot of questions for you as someone who's, who's been a big fan of your career, but I kind of like want to start kind of chronologically sort of back in time and kind of build our way up if, if that works for you. But um, you're the first and only, you know, Caesar Gracie black belt and there can only be one, man. So uh, that's, yeah. that's amazing. So I, I really want to learn, like, you know, how did you meet Caesar Gracie and, and how did you become his first, you know, how are you sort of deemed chosen and yeah. going through that? So when I, you know, I grew up wrestling, um, my dad passed away when I was young, but, uh, thankfully I got this amazing stepfather that, you know, he was always into martial arts and stuff like that and boxing and wrestling and he wrestled college. Okay. So, you know, for Christmas, we'd always get like boxing gloves and, uh, it's weird. He's actually the first one that knocked me out. <laughs> I remember, it happens. You know, yeah, I remember sparring with him in like eighth grade and just getting hit by a man like, oh, but uh, he was tough, man, you know, yeah. and, uh, anyways, he was, you know, really into the UFC when it first started, they were mm. just, you know, Dave, you got to check this out, and, uh, you know, with me doing all the wrestling stuff, the, mm -hmm. there wasn't too many schools in town, there was like a Sambo school, you know, but um, wow, you could tap the instructor the first day when you're like 16, Mm. it's probably not you know yeah probably not the real deal yeah yeah we stayed there for a little bit and then finally I had a cousin uh, named Andre Kabazi mm. and they're both of my cousins uh him and his son are black belts now but he was taking private lessons from Half Gracie oh, okay and I just you know I knew I needed to get that kind of training so finally you know I walked in there one day and I started training with Half. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was amazing, you know, just idolizing the guy and, sure. you know, seeing him fight. It, it was like a dream come true. Um, yeah. Something happened where he took over the school in uh, Mountain View and then Caesar came back to the Pleasant Hill School. And then, you know, one day all of a sudden Caesar was my coach then, which was cool. And I, I, I just stayed with Caesar. Um, a lot of people left and went with Half, but I, uh, I stayed with Caesar and I stayed mm -hmm. in that location and, mm -hmm. uh, shit, I guess that's all she wrote. You know, I just kept training yeah. and training. What was it about? Um, I'm really fascinated, like uh, with a couple of things about that, uh, that whole era in your life, really, because obviously timing and all these circumstances came together where you and ultimately all these guys, diverged on this one place and it became the scrap pack later but like i'm just fascinated with like what was it about maybe caesar's teaching or something that attracted all you young competitive guys like you jake nick nate what was that environment like how did that happen it can it, does that make sense yeah well you know basically when uh, gracie jiu-jitsu first started there wasn't that many academies around mm. so People would come from Sacramento. They'd commute a couple hours to get the Caesars. They would come from Stockton. They would come from all over. And a lot yeah. of them were like uh, karate instructors. Wow. You know, they were kind of thinking like, we need to get our belt so we can gotcha. add this to our programs. So with a lot of those people coming in, they all eventually had their own fighters of their own. Mm. So, you know, the umbrella got bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And with all the uh, fighters they produced, we all just kind of came together, you know? Yeah, sure. Um, what yeah. was weird is it just kind of shows you how life works as, uh, you know, Half Gracie at the time, he had one of the craziest teams ever, you know, uh, Kurt Osiander left and went with him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he had all the Penn brothers. Mm. Uh, man, he just had Cameron Earl. He had these legends that were mm -hmm. just, he had on uh, all the uh, on the mat guys. He mm. his team was just so solid, and you know we had a very young team, young. and we just stayed loyal and we stayed with our team. And it's just funny how it worked. I think mm. every one of us fought for a title in the UFC. Uh, yes, 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's so, it's crazy because, uh, and I, I know you know this, but I recently interviewed Jake Shields as well on, on the show and just doing the research just between you and Jake alone. Um, and you fought for the, yeah, you fought for the, the belt and, and the UFC and everything as well. I, just between the group of you guys, you all fight for, fought for titles. Some, most, most of you guys fought for multiple titles and multiple different organizations as well. But it, it blew my mind. And my wife is a documentary filmmaker and she focuses mostly on like mental health sort of uh, projects. But I, I swear to hand to a Bible, like turned to her the other night and I said, babe, when I make like a million dollars, I pr- will you please, can I finance a documentary? on these guys i was like there's so there's something <laughs> about there's something so fascinating about what you all became like it's amazing that you all fulfilled these amazing dreams and 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 i think like the most intriguing part of it is is kind of like you because jake said in our episode he, to quote him you know he's like david could have been the ufc champ but he chose to teach like that was his passion yeah. and it's true you have your academy and i follow you and your students but um, and maybe this is taking us a little bit off track, but, but did you always have that passion to teach with jujitsu or did you know that ultimately that was what you wanted to do is where fighting would lead you? I always kind of dreamed about being in the UFC. You know, I, I would dream about having an academy mm-hmm. and it's, it's not that I just have this crazy passion for coaching fighters because I don't like coaching fighters. Okay. I like just the kind of the family atmosphere of having the academy. But mm-hmm. once I got to 30 years old, you know, and I won my last fight, they were talking about another, you know, um, another title fight, win one mm-hmm. more and have another title. But as you know, my wife got pregnant and I started having kids. I just, I don't know. I didn't like that lifestyle. Just kind of the person that sure. I became. You know, you're, you're put up on this pedestal. Everyone's giving you free sponsors and money and you got all these women coming at you. And I didn't, I didn't like it, you know? And once I decided to settle down, um, I think I would have still continued to fight if it was like once a year, but, um, you know, Crosley Gracie said to me one time, um, he said, Dave, you know, if I make 40 grand off my Academy every month, And I got to go train for three months for this fight. And I'm only getting 20 grand to fight. Like I'm just losing money, you know? And that's how I kind of felt, you know, you're fighting for a title in UFC and you're getting 10 grand or something, you know, it's just, it just got old, you know, at first I I love competing and I would have done it for free. I mean, most of these guys do it for the attention anyways. Yeah. I would have done it for free at first, but after a while of just training that hard and Mm -hmm. it pulling me away from my academy, I was like, man, I just, I'm making way more money doing the academy thing. And Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just wanted to be there for my family. You know, I didn't think that I could properly, I couldn't train in Santa Rosa and still get the training camps I needed. I would have had to move and yeah, it just was time. You know, I competed my whole life. It was, I love competing. You know, I was a kid that, would enter you know adult divisions when i was a kid and Mm -hmm. i loved if there was a tournament i would compete but it's just it's funny once i had a family Mm -hmm. my academy probably quadrupled in business you know because i finally started putting that effort to it you know yeah yeah it makes total sense. Your priorities changed and, and yeah, you, you sort of matured to another stage into your life. And it's really amazing as I hear you detail that, how, how you were able to kind of logically come to all of those decisions yourself, because so many fighters struggle with losing that identity of being the fighter, you know? Um, and I imagine that, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a fighter, but I imagine that would be so hard, you know, because it is so attractive, you know, it's like, Everybody wants to be friends with the, the fighter. Who doesn't, you know? Um, so it's, it's so it's, it's inspirational. I hope to other fighters, you know, to help them kind of move on as they transition. Uh, that's yeah. really interesting. Do, do you feel like you get that um, need for competition met just through maybe your own students now coaching them through jujitsu? I mean, my main passion is training, mm. you know, just, Last week, I took my kids to Florida for a uh, like a jujitsu competition, mm-hmm. and I missed a couple days of training. And you know, I didn't like it. So, okay, pretty religiously, every day, six days a week, I roll. I try to get an hour of mat time in a day. Sometimes I'll go an hour and a half, but um, oh. 
my main passion is just getting on the mats and that's like my therapy is rolling yeah. you know i don't really do as much stand-up anymore um mm -hmm. that's another thing that you know i know i suffered some concussions and mm -hmm. just being in combat sports all that all those years but um Sure. I'm glad I didn't get my brain too messed up because I feel now that I'm 43, I'm starting to have some side effects, you know, mm. maybe from the concussions and stuff. And uh, mm. it just once it's over and you look back, you're kind of like, fuck, you know, it uh, takes its toll. Right. Hard, you know? Yeah. yeah it's, it's been hard to kind of drive lately. And some mm -hmm. of the anxiety is getting a little worse. I mean, um, but yeah, I'm glad I didn't take too many shots because I feel like some of those dudes are going to have a tough road ahead of them, you know? For sure. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, I work yeah. a lot of, I counsel with a lot of men and women with PTSD and uh, not really fighter specific, but I know that that exists as, you know, as a repercussion of head trauma or any trauma, you know, I'll say physical trauma, emotional trauma. And my heart really goes out to these fighters because for a lot of reasons, but the decisions you make at 21 or 22, when you want to be the champion of the world, you know, I, I, I was a wrestler and I wanted to be an, an Olympian. So I took that as far as I could go. And I, I broke my back, you know, I gave up my body to that pursuit and I never got close, <laughs> you know, and I, I really, I, but I feel good. I forgot about that. I got that fixed. You know, you can't do that to the brain. So I, I feel so you know, I'm so empathetic to fighters and what they sacrifice and what they give. I really am. Um, so I, I'm sorry to hear that you struggle with that stuff. A, mil a million percent yeah. you have my support, but I do appreciate you being honest and, and sharing yeah. that too, because there are fighters out there right now that are going to say, I'll give anything. And, you know, they don't it's over and you're in those shoes, you know, like, uh, like my, I think my third black belt, Joe Soto, he retired from the UFC and yeah. he called me he called me yesterday and he's already gotten, you know, multiple eye surgeries and, you know, retina, re everything is messed up. But now he's got to completely go through the other surgery on the other eye. So mm -hmm. stuff like that, you know, like, um, right. I try to limit some of my guys just doing like hard, hard sparring, mm -hmm. you know, in practice, um, more mm -hmm. technical sparring. We've obviously had those days where everybody was just banging and banging and right. banging. It's just not good for you. Combined with, you know, fighting, mm -hmm. it's not going to last that long. Right. I mean, you can only, t yeah, you, you can only absorb so much. I mean, that's it. You know, that, yeah. And yeah, exactly. And it's going to take a toll. And yeah, um, I guess maybe, maybe switching gears a little bit, though. It, it is great to hear that, you know, physically you're still able to roll maybe an hour, hour and a half a day. Like you, you yeah. look like, like you haven't aged much, you know? So <laughs> are you like Jake? Like, are you a vegan or do you like uh, have a fitness diet or something you sort of try to adhere to? Well, I think some of the fighters, you know, they, they never quite leave that lifestyle, you know? And um, the main thing with me is I always get, probably 10, 11 hours of sleep a day Good for you. I've always been huge in the sleep and, uh, I don't, I don't drink or do nothing. You know, a lot of these mm -hmm. dudes, if you're out partying and drinking like crazy, I mean, we see them, it just ages the shit out of yeah. them. You know? Yeah. Big time. Yeah. I, pretty simple, man. You know, I just, mm -hmm. I go to the Academy every day and I just, mm -hmm. I don't know. I kind of like, I just kind of would be with my family. I sleep yeah. a lot. Yeah. But I don't I don't party or drink and I know that really ages you, you know. For sure. So, yeah, I don't I'm not a vegan or nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. I eat okay. I'm not on like a crazy diet, but man, I think just training every day and getting yeah. enough sleep is is fucking key, you know. Huge. Yeah, huge. Yeah, that's amazing. So, I wanted to ask you too a little bit um you know, you have a lot of highlights, like fighting highlights for sure. But before maybe I, I jump into the UFC stuff, what was it like fighting in Japan for Pancras? Like you were there, like it kind of maybe the tail end of that, but it was still Japan when it was huge. Like, uh, yeah. what was that? And you were so young. So what was that experience like? I liked it, you know. Um, I thought it was amazing because I never really fought for the attention. So what was cool about that is like, you know, when I fought in the UFC and I lost, I'd go out to dinner and some bum would tell me what I needed to do to win that's never fought before. Sure. Like, oh, you should have did this. And I'm just, it always make me mad and I'd want to slap course. the guy. <laughs> yeah, of course. When I, yeah. 
when I would fight in Japan, no one knew I fought. Wow. So I could literally go over there, whoop somebody, come back. You know, they give you a stack of cash, <laughs> right. no checks. Yeah. It was fun. You know, one yeah. time I went over there after a three year layoff and they always put you with a guy that has way higher credentials. You know, like one time a guy had 75 fights. Oh, my God. I fought him. So you always fight some guy. They kind of but it's nice. You know, you don't have fans yelling at you, calling you a loser. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they're real quiet. And um, I love the city. You know, a lot of times when I would get ready to fight, mm -hmm. my legs would be sore because I would just be walking around Tokyo all wow. fucking day. Wow. You know, but yeah. I really liked it. You know, uh, when I left Pancras, I still had a contract. And what they did is they traded me to the UFC and the UFC gave them they took three pancreas fighters and give them three fights apiece mm. if they let me out of my contract. Wow. So that's what was cool is I was supposed yeah. to fight for a title in pancreas, yeah. but I never got to fight for a title because they traded me. That's just amazing. Wow. What a cool story. Yeah. Wow. What a really know, cool it, story. it was pretty cool, but I like, I definitely like fighting in Japan better mm -hmm. um, just because you could get away. And uh, it, it was fun, man. No one really knew you fought, you know? So that's what I liked about it. Yeah. Now, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, maybe moving on to the UFC stuff, though. I mean, you you know, you had some great – you had kind of high – I'll say maybe high highs, low lows. Is that fair to say in the in the UFC? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, you fought the best of the best immediately. You were in there, and you were, like, top five in the world. <laughs> and then you – I feel like immediately in, what, your second or third fight, you fought for the title? It came quick, yeah, right? My, my second fight, yeah. They had this – they had a weird thing against the guy at the time. They really wanted me to beat him, you know. Mm. They made it clear that they wanted me to, to, to bring me in to, to beat this guy. Okay. You know, and uh, I think a lot, a lot of people nowadays, you know, they see fighters taking fights on short notice, and sometimes they get lucky, sometimes they don't. But mm -hmm. every experience that I've faced with my fighters taking fights on short notice – usually they get hurt <laughs> sure you know yeah, you're unprepared i mean yeah fractured neck a lot of times cool. fractured or fractured uh, orbital but mm. for me anytime i've ever had to take a fight on short notice my two losses are from short notice fights you know and sure. i just i can't really get my mind right to fight a five round fight or a 25 minute fight both fights i lost uh they were going to be 25 minute bouts and mm -hmm. i just uh something with the mental i just couldn't really prepare myself but mm. every other fight you know like when i fought my first fight in the ufc i was able to train four months for it oh wow so yeah getting down to the 185 weight class you want to do it right you know mm -hmm. you don't want to just suck the water out so mm -hmm. it takes me a while to get lean and get down there but you are I had the guy yeah i wondered about that because you're are you six one you're tall too. I'm six, I'm six foot, but just for some reason, you know, if I don't watch what I'm doing, I could get to 230 just like really quick. Sure, sure. And that's that's kind of what happened, uh, you know, with the title fight. I remember them saying like, you know, it was about six weeks notice and I was 230. Yeah. So I did want some more time with that fight, but um, they said, hey, we're gonna, we'll have to give it to somebody else. You'll miss this opportunity. Right. And um I guess that's one of the biggest things I didn't like about um, I don't like being told when I have to fight, you know, I'd rather just maybe fight once a year. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't like fighting all the time, you know, because the mm -hmm. preparation was just grueling. Right. Yeah. You said it a couple of times and um, I think this is like why people, or at least why I'm so fascinated with this, the scrap pack too. You, you, you said a couple of times, you, you never sought like to get, famous or popular or to get attention like you wanted to kind of fight to fight is what i'm hearing so like i mean i guess let me ask that what were a couple of your first fights is that what they were i mean i know your mma fights like i mean i, I guess were you like uh just like nick and nate and you were like if someone's down we'll just roll out the mats and go uh, um well our first fight that we fought on i think bj penn was with how and we all fought on the same card. And back then, you couldn't have MMA in California. Right. It so wasn't sanctioned for a long time. It was, oh, yeah. Total underground fight where 
you're like real cautious about the ticket sales and they lock the doors and wow. that was kind of that was kind of weird yeah up as a young kid like 18 19 and you know facing someone you have no idea who he is and just the whole wow. underground thing that's kind of how it started before it transitioned to indian like uh casinos you know mm-hmm. so it's yeah, so crazy um, to think, like, I know wrestling and you show up and you don't know who you're going to wrestle. And that was scary enough, but I can't imagine showing up and you don't know who you're going to fight. And it's like, here's a grown man. Good luck. <laughs> like, you have no idea what their back yeah. is. Like, nothing. That's crazy. They always look so intimidating, though. You'll see, like, these big giants. <sighs> or you're just kind of like, what am I doing? And then <laughs> you just end up smashing these guys. Yeah. You know? It yeah. always kind of feels like that at first, but sure. yeah they end up sucking it's so funny yeah it's crazy yeah well you know and this that's another reason why i think i, I fell in love with jujitsu because it, for that very reason you see the big strong guy and then you, he's taken down like that and then all of a sudden you go what happened there and they're tapping for their life or panicking you know and it was like wow there's some magic going on you know um oh, yeah. which, which kind of brings me to you like your teaching and stuff man I, i'm a follower of like your school and and you on instagram and stuff and you're really good about putting up really cool, like little videos and stuff. You'll do like cool arm locks and stuff, man. I, I wanted to ask you this. Did you always prefer maybe no gi over gi? And did that influence your, your kind of teaching style? Well, at first, you know, I never thought I would ever take the gi off again. I remember wow. saying one time, like, I'm going to keep this gi forever. You know, after like six months of training every day, it ripped in half. But, um, I really liked gi when I started, you know, I, I wrestled a lot of wrestling matches before that, but, mm -hmm. um, I started taking the gi off. I, I went to Henzo's one time and I think I was a purple belt, you know, he let me stay with them for a couple of weeks and okay. everybody was really good. No gi even back then, because Henzo always had these fights coming up, you know? Mm -hmm. So I said, Henzo, man, you guys are doing really good with me. You know, I did really well too, you know, but they just felt a little better. You know, my definition of gilas was just taking my top off mm. using the gi pants. Okay. And uh, they all had like shorts on. Okay. So he said, looked at me and was like, Dave, I haven't wore a gi for like five, six years. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, and he said, you know, like he was talking about Matt Sarah could pass somebody's guard and arm bar, even if you're dripping sweat. Mm -hmm. And he said, that takes a real skill to do that you know, the gi, you have a lot of handles and it's a lot easier to get arm bars and passes and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of started thinking about it, you know, and I think when I got to a brown, I really stopped wearing the gi as much because everybody was so focused on fighting. You'd see these, you know, multiple time world champions go into a fight and they couldn't yeah. execute any of their offense. Right. So I definitely, you know, wanted to get used to all the grips and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, yeah, you know, it takes a while. It's not easy when you don't have the gi, you know? You do a lot of really innovative stuff though. And, and, and I watch, I'm not surprised to learn now that you wrestled growing up only because a lot of the stuff you'll post on Instagram is like chain movements. You'll post this to this yeah. to this. And I'm like, wow, I never thought of that, you know? But it, it's, that's why I really follow you. It's, it's really cool. I love yeah. your technique. That's really Thank interesting. Thank you, man. Yeah. yeah, I try to post stuff that you haven't quite seen mm -hmm. that isn't on like other websites and stuff, just yeah. little tricks and stuff. And then I figured if I ever do an instructional, I'll break them down and actually explain it. Sure. So I'll just do like kind of a quick video. And then, yeah, if I decide to do some, you know, instructionals, I could break it down slower and tell you how to get into the position, you know? Yeah, so, sure. You got a lot of cool stuff. I mean, yeah, but, but you Thanks, been for 20 years or more. So, but yeah, it makes sense. You would have acquired some of these things by now, right? For sure. Yeah, little little tricks you learn here, there. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. So is there anything um, – you said you were at a – I know we're, we're coming up on time, but – so um, you said you were at a competition last weekend with some students. Do you have anything else coming up, maybe this summer or anything on the mind as far as uh, any other competitions or anything you guys will be participating in? I think as the state opens up, you know, we've had a tough time with this COVID. Sure. Um, you know, basically California was shut down. So my main focus right now is just – trying to get my students back you know mm -hmm. 
every academy had lost a lot of students. So now we're just trying to kind of recover, yeah, get our students back. But because everyone's had such um, a lot of time off, I, a lot of my fighters are looking for fights and people sure. want to compete and they just, they kind of want the world to go back to normal. So mm -hmm. I think I'm going to continue to look for tournaments out of the state until this state opens. Okay. And uh, yeah, we got some wrestling tournaments that we're going to go to for my kids and uh, well, try good. to keep, try to keep them active, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. As best I can. I, I get, I get that <laughs> hundred percent. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I also try to ask everybody kind of before before we let him go, sort of any final words or advice or is there anything maybe you, you like? I know it sounds cliche, but I always like to give someone the opportunity, like if there's any sort of thing that like motivates you or you, again, advice you like to share with anyone, you know, yeah. what that be. I guess the main thing that would be nice to kind of point out is, um, you know, I don't have like the biggest platform, but I, I try my best locally to just kind of give back, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people helped me along the way. And now that I could look back at everything, um, I kind of see the big picture of giving back, you know, so mm -hmm. any opportunity I get, I like to give back. And I think people that do have a larger platform, they need to um, stop being so selfish and start giving back themselves. You know, sure. there's famous people that never do shit for anybody. They just post selfies about themselves every day. And, you know, with the following they have, they could do a lot of good in this world. And, yeah. you know, I think people need to save time to give back. Yeah. Thank you for that, man. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I totally agree. And, and I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate you doing this, you know, you taking the time to share some of this and, and I do, I encourage everybody also to give back a little, you know, make, make time to give to others. And, oh yeah, and uh, yeah, I think a lot of the times, like, even when I feel my worst, if I go and like do something else for someone else, I inevitably selfishly feel better for it. Oh like, yeah. yeah. Dude, 100% man. Yeah, exactly. Any kind of message I could send, you know, like I want to do a post today. Uh, one of my kids, uh, wrestling partners, they've been wrestling with for probably two years. Um, he's only 12 years old. He was riding his bike home a couple of days ago and he got hit by a drunk driver. Mm just a total random thing. And, uh, I mean, I just feel like I know so many people that are always stepping into vehicles, drinking, and, uh, the kid lost his leg, you know, probably never oh, be able to God. wrestle again. It's just shit like that, that, you know, this world has so many scumbags in it that people need to be aware of that. You know, he killed another guy, he hit the kid, killed oh, another God. guy. Yeah. I mean, he didn't need to get into that truck and drive that day, you know? No, it's easier so, now than ever to call an Uber or something. Like it's never been easier. Yeah. So that's what I'm please saying. Please post man. that and I'm I'll share it as well. A hundred percent. Yeah, please. Contribute please do, brother. as well. Yeah, of course. And and uh yeah, a totally worthy cause and, and that's such a shame. But yeah, it's just exactly because those things exist, it's even more important that we stay positive and that we do these things to support others and give a hand up. Oh yeah. And and you're so oh, right. Yeah. You know, people did it for us and we can't lose sight of that. You know, no one ever exactly got it there alone right you know hell no they think they do but they don't <laughs> true yeah wow. awesome nice thank you so Dad. much again david for coming thank on this is a true story thank you man thank you man true story with john gibson and david terrell thank you brother